Hi, thank you for joining us today for Meet the Makers Live. My name is Patricia Sampson, and I'm the manager of retail shops and visual merchandising here at the High Museum of Art. Today, I'll introduce you to five of our 10 local artisans and creatives who are participating in this year's holiday market. I also have with me today, Ashley Wills, who is our media production specialist. She'll be taking your questions. Before I introduce you to our first artist, here are a few reminders. Please open your screen to gallery mode to see all of our cameras. We welcome questions. If you have a question for an artist, please enter it in the chat box and we'll do our best to get them answered. Remember that you can begin your shopping experience at any time by clicking the link to our web shop. If you'd like to shop in person, you can do that too. The museum shop is open Tuesday through Sunday from 12 p.m. to 5 p.m. Today is just part one of Meet the Makers Live, so you'll have to join us again tomorrow at 11 a.m. to meet the rest of the, ar the artists who are participating in the holiday market. Our first artist is Nicole Carter. She is a designer and the founder of Style Bliss Jewels. Welcome, Nicole. Thank you. It is such a pleasure to be here. I am honored and grateful to be a part of I'm so, Yeah, I'm so excited to have you today um, and to talk to us about your beautiful jewelry line. As you can see, I am wearing the earrings for this that. broadcast. <laughs> and they are wonderful. Thank you. I'm so glad to see you. Yeah. So tell me, um, Nicole, how did Style Bliss begin and um, what makes your product so unique? Sure. I'd love to answer that question. Thank you for it. Well, first of all, I have always been interested and have always had an appreciation for fashion and style and the art of design and jewelry. But to be perfectly honest, I did not even imagine becoming a self-taught jewelry designer. The fact of the matter is that there were two distinct moments that really kind of pointed me in that direction. And the first being, to be perfectly honest, is when my grandmother gifted me this beautiful gold neck, well, not even a finished necklace, but it was simply a chain. And I had a concept for it. And mind you, at that time, I had never designed any piece of jewelry in my life. So when she had gifted me with that beautiful chain to work with, just in whatever creative idea I came up with, she literally started kind of more or less that path of me creating from that. So I took that chain, literally brought it home and spent countless unimaginable hours just re or deconstructing and recreating pieces from jewelry that I had accumulated over the years. So with that happening, I just began to create those pieces wore them, incorporated that necklace into one of them, and the reaction was amazing. So from there, I wanted to do something more original, and then that's when really glass came into the fold, because I just wanted to do something unique that wasn't often utilized in jewelry, and that happened as a result of my mother giving me a beautiful piece of glass. She always has an amazing eye for decor and unique finds. And she asked me literally if I thought I could put something together with that. Long story short, I did 15 pieces later and a fully developed website, the brand was born. So that is the short of the long of it, but it was from passion really. And I saw that this talent was developing and just wanted to do more with it when I thought that I might've had something there. Yeah. Wow, that's a wonderful story. And um, you, know, you mentioned that your pieces are um, made of glass. So how do you source that? Because they are so beautiful. And even the piece we have on our camera here is just absolutely amazing. The blue, the colors um, that are within uh, the glass pieces, where do you source those? It literally scour all over. I, when I'm creating a piece, I start with the glass because that's literally my signature design element and my primary element. And every other piece or material that I incorporate into the fold of the design, 
comes after the glass is developed. So I take glass, I mean, just like raw pieces that I deconstruct and use in very unique ways. So I literally have sea glass from Puerto Rico, for instance, wow. all the locally sourced glass that just have, you know, no real dimension to it. But then I conceptualize and create glass that has dimension. I have a couple of examples here that just kind of gives it more, like I said, dimension, but also versatility because as fine as glass is and fragile, it's amazing just how versatile it can become carefully, <laughs> but how yeah. so all yeah, of absolutely. Yeah, and these are just a couple of pieces that do that to kind of give it the added level of dimension and versatility. Right. So I'm going to try to, because this is just a beautiful piece. I'm going to lift it off of this <laughs> mannequin here. It's such a beautiful piece. And I want to hold it up close so that people can actually see that mm -hmm. um, glass in there. And it's such beautiful colors of the browns and the blues. And then you have a little bit of silver in there. And it's just, I just found it was just amazing um, that uh, this was glass, actually. Yeah, it actually looks like a stone. Yeah, which is cool that's there. I really wanted to kind of make that the case. And again, glass is always kind of the central focal point. But even when you turn that piece around, it's a different texture. Well, not texture so much, but design on the back. So it kind of gives you the feel of a watercolor, which, you know, is part of the whole design process because I do want to have my designs exude the feeling of bliss and paradise and feeling of comfort um, while you wear it and even when you view it. So with that piece, that literally is one necklace, it's called lava and it's complemented by another piece of glass or crystal rather that really brings it all together, unifies the piece as a whole, you know, yeah. whole piece in, it, in itself. Wow. Well, it's absolutely beautiful. Um, so tell me a little bit about how your design process starts. Sure, well, that's interesting because I get different inspiration from different places and just in, in my environment, I really gravitate to, towards, I mean, simple pleasures, you know, certain places and spaces that move me artistically. I mean, like I said, they can range from serene settings to architecture, to just, just style in general, to travel, to contemporary art and all of those elements really focus and bring into my design concept and how I really create. So I, I get really present in that space when I'm being inspired and I use that to move me. So I can have inspiration that really comes from different places. For instance, I can be you know having a moment with decor and it could be the colors and the, and the different textures that move me. And I will literally create a piece that embodies that, you know? So it comes from different angles and different places for that whole concept to happen. So I take the glass as you, you know, as it is, and I really add dimension to it. This is an example of like one flat glass, but I literally created it to have some dimensional. So it's almost like a reflective effect, effect right? And from there, I, I build it with the different materials that'll be incorporated into the design element. Here, it's hematite. Here, I mean, it's a stainless steel chain. And then the versatility factor comes when, you know, I have a drop back, but this back is detachable. So it gives you, you know, kind of a, a variety in one look. And I think about that when I'm conceptual, well, when I'm conceptualizing designs that really comes into play because I definitely right. want it to have some range. And right, so it seems like you have a more of a collective, a eclectic uh, style of designing and um, putting together your pieces. So you wrote uh, that your motivation to design jewelry extends beyond the passion of um, as let me say that again, that your motivation to design extends beyond your passion to do so as a form of personal and artistic expression. Um, can you, in the last few minutes, just expound on that for us? Absolutely. I mean, I, I really, again, being a self-taught designer and someone who didn't even, who had a love for fashion but didn't fathom designing jewelry, and I thank God every day that I do because it brings me such joy. 
but I never, you know, I looked at the name in which my, you know, in my design comes to be with style bliss. And it's not only about the style of the jewelry, but it's the bliss that not only it brings me, but that I hope resonates with other people. So I look at it as a whole experience. I mean, from the design to the way I articulate that on my website, you know, and to give it a full experience for whoever is, you know, viewing it, admiring it, wearing it. So it takes it from beyond what's the actual to what I hope, you know, continues on with the brand and the feeling that it generates through the jewelry pieces. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. Um, well, um, what can we expect in closing from you going forward in 2021? Yes, oh, as we look towards it, right? <laughs> so what I look to do more so is obviously, you know, to begin with the, the fact of designing. You know, that's that's here to stay and just evolving my process of designing. During the my I really created a piece that, you know, like this one, which is the newest collection that I launched, which gives the opportunity to wear a piece in different ways. So I want to continue with the versatility of it. Um, the message that I hope resonates with people who are either wearing my jewelry or admiring it near or far and just continue to stay on that path and build brand. Okay, well, it sounds like you have your work cut out for you and you have a plan. Um, Nicole, I'd like to thank you again for being with us, taking part again this year. This is your second year in our holiday artisan market, and we are so delighted to have you um, with us. And I wish you and your family a safe and happy holiday. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. And it was an honor and pleasure to be featured. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you for joining us, Nicole. I just wanted to say that we got one comment on Facebook that just says lovely works of art. And I totally agree. They're so beautiful. I wonder you have a minute left. Is there any uh, necklaces that you have next to you that you'd like to show a little bit of a close up view? Sure, thanks for asking, Ashley. Well, this would be probably good to start since I kind of ended on that note, but this piece is called Destiny, and it is a part of a collective called the Vita Collection, and it's comprised of four different necklaces, and this is actually one necklace that can be worn three different ways. It can be worn layered as you see it. It can also be worn long because, the you know, these do detach discreetly, but they detach. And you can wear it long and just kind of slip it over your neck. And also equally as important, it can be worn with a mask. So this literally detaches and they hook onto your mask to be stylish and safe at the same time. So with the, that piece, again, it's part of the overall collective that I created during the pandemic. Obviously it stirred up some emotion and feeling to create it to have multiple purposes. So with or without a mask, mostly with, that you'll be able to wear this um, through and through. It'll be timeless in the way that it was created for this time and, and beyond this time. And these pieces, again, like I alluded to, this is called Euphoria. And this is a piece that you know may look weighty, but it's actually balanced, because I think a lot about that when creating, to be able to equal the balance and it not feeling so heavy on you when you wear it, day or night. So with this piece, I you know had a drop back and the versatility factor is when you disconnect detach rather, this from the piece, you can wear it with or without. And this last piece over here is part of the collection. And this did extremely well, so well, that I have to, um, I'm, I'm reintroducing it slightly differently with a different chain. But again, this is a versatile piece. The versatility also comes with uh, the glass that I rework by hand that is two-tone. So it's tan in the front, or brown in the front, tan in the back. And then this is one necklace and it's layered. So you can wear it long and this literally drops in the back behind your neck and the other piece drops forward and this is detachable. So again, versatility and the working with glass is really, really important to me. And it's, it's just an experience that I enjoy immensely. And I hope to communicate that you know, through my pieces each and every time I create a new one. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you again, Nicole. And um, we hope to sell more of your jewelry. And we are certainly happy to have you again with us this year. Thank you both. It's been an honor. Okay. Our next artist 
is a lady who designs the most beautiful scarves, apparel, and home accessories. Please meet Sarah Anderson of Sarah Anderson Design. Hi, Sarah. I think you have to unmute there. Yeah. Hi. Awesome. Hi, how are you this morning? I'm great. How are you? Happy holidays. Happy holidays to you as well. Um, well, Sarah, let me tell you, your uh, designs are just absolutely beautiful, first off. And I am, as you notice, wearing your kimono. I did see um, that. I figured I'd show it off because as I was unpacking them uh, to put on display, I just thought, wow, these are so beautiful. And that um, we just had to show them in a more close up way for our uh, viewers and for our guests. Thank you, Patricia. Yeah, I saw that this morning and I was like, oh, how, what a cheery moment. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Sarah, tell me, you are formal, a formally trained artist. Uh, you hold a BFA um, from Maryland Institute uh, College of Art and Design, and um, also you attended Georgia State. How did you transition from paper or canvas uh, as a medium to apparel and home accessories? Well, uh, actually, that came uh, a good bit later. I've always been a lover of printmaking as well as uh, painting, and I love textiles. And so throughout my life, I've just been in awe of every culture's different approach to textile. Mm -hmm. And I uh, did some printmaking within the textile world for a little while. While. And to create what I create now uh, by hand, individually, piece by piece, was onerous. It was overwhelming. And technology actually changed my uh, approach in that I can uh, create my artwork. I usually create uh, a piece and then I upload that into uh, my computer and I digitally work with that. Then my images are sent. Uh, to a manufacturer. So uh, it, it really sort of has created the ability to do what I do, which is um, limited edition uh, designs mm -hmm. and um, change them, come up with new things that are fun for me and for my customers. And uh, so it's kind of a marriage of old school and new technology, things that are just possible now that weren't possible 15 years ago. Right, so are so you said they are laser printed or digitally printed. what type of technique do they use? It's a digital printer. So oh, okay. it's, you know, it, and, and it's pretty, it, it's actually just truly amazing. And uh, it is um, run through a huge, just like a, an enormous printer. And the fabric is then, uh, and, and that includes silk, silk cashmere, and then it's finished by people by hand or pieced by oh, people. Wow. Mm -hmm. wow, and most of your pieces are silk, um, uh, and silk cashmere, and they actually feel like butter. You just want to yeah. wrap yourself in it. <laughs> Yeah. That that like, is that is an often heard comment. It's just like, oh my goodness, like butter, oh. you know. <laughs> but um, you have a um, I noticed that in most of your designs, you do have a wonderful uh, take, and they have a flair of Japanese prints and patterns. And uh, I'd like you to tell us a little bit about how that all came about for you. Well, you know, I was raised by parents who are artists in different modalities, and my godfather was the curator of decorative arts for uh, two different museums. And so I had a lot of exposure to different, different arts, the different arts. And um, I have just always been drawn to Japanese prints, woodblock prints. And the, the pattern and the, the the complexity and the simplicity all at the same time has always spoken to me. And I even remember when I was in college looking at them and thinking, I am so young. I have no, I have no way to even approach this except to just appreciate it. 
And so here I am, I'm not so young. Here I am, just, <laughs> here I am not not here anymore. And uh, <laughs> looking at it and going, okay, I, I'm gonna step up to the plate and do my voice in this. And um, just with deep love and reference, but also with just, I, I mean, I am a huge lover of art history. And so I just try, and nature. So I sort of try to weave all this in and um, do and study nature a lot, and then try to create an expression uh, in the forms that have always spoken to me. Yeah, well, you've done an, a wonderful job of that in uh, incorporating um, nature and uh, botanicals in your uh, pieces have been uh, just just fantastic Thank and we we've carried your scarves in the past and they uh, not only have nature but then you do some abstract patterns as well and they look fantastic so tell me um, what do you have on the horizons I know you have a new collection out there you're working on well I uh, just am actually premiering my silk scarves with you so uh, I have, a, they're nowhere else. They're not even on my website. Um, wow, yeah. that's good to know. We're exclusive. Yeah, just, yeah, Atlanta, we're exclusive. You are. <laughs> you are. I haven't done any. Uh, so this, this year in your, in your sale, I have a women's neck scarf. I have a mm -hmm. men's pocket square, which is my first exclusive men's product. And I have a larger 36 inch by 36 sort of, Hermes world style uh, size scarf that, like I said, they're not on my website. So I see myself extending into more of the silk pieces and maybe even like the thin scarf um, next. And um, I have also been working on my home goods, which are on my website. And mm -hmm. I am, I, you know, I, like I just, there are a million things that I can think of to do that I'm so excited about doing. And the problem is I just have to continually try to create the bandwidth to cover all those uh, angles, but yeah. Right, right. Well, you know, that's a, um, you know, a lot to uh, change, shift and change with because one moment you're in the apparel and then uh, with the home goods. But what I do like about your products is that you translate those patterns into each um, category. So it's, um, we can see a pattern, for example, this beautiful kimono that I'm wearing. Um, you know, we can see that pattern as well as uh, in the, apparel and then you can translate that pattern into home goods as well so you know it could easily be a table runner uh print which is really well, nice yeah it's it's and it's a lot of fun to kind of be able to take your vision and see it and i you know my experience is that somebody there may be somebody out there that really wants beautiful apparel but mm -hmm. COVID, you know, there are also a lot of people out there that really want to be at home. We're at home. We're looking at our table a lot. <laughs> so, yeah, I uh, just, I, and my, my whole thing is to make it art, you know, mm -hmm. just like printmaking. It is my, my take on printmaking and um, printmaking and things that we bring into our lives are either what we wear or what we put in our homes that makes us have an authentic expression and it is not something that is at target it is right, right, that, right. Yeah. and, and, and if you choose it for yourself or you choose it as a gift for someone there probably won't be anybody else wearing that exactly absolutely um actually do we have any questions or comments out there we do have one question. It's kind of broad, but uh, they say thank you for your, all of your beautiful works. And they're wondering if there are images of the artist's works on the website to review and purchase. And there absolutely are. Uh, please do check out the High Museum website. It's museumshop.high.org. Um, we are definitely taking your questions both on Facebook and in the Zoom. And I also want to point out that we are posting 
uh, videos of every artist and Sarah's video went out on Wednesday and there's a lot of really great detail shots of a lot of her work. Uh, there's a really beautiful butterfly pattern that caught my eye. So definitely check, check out those videos as well to get some really great gift ideas. Thank you. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Well, you know, um, one thing I noticed in your uh, questions, we did like a little questionnaire with all of our artists and this one stood out for me. Uh, one statement that you made, you said that your Aunt Violet used to say, anything worth doing is worth doing right. And um, you added an amendment to that statement. Now, let me tell you, your Aunt Violet and my mother must have been in the same school <laughs> because she pretty much said the same thing. If you're going to do it, do it right. Don't half do it. So, but um, why don't you tell us a little bit about your amendment to that? I don't remember what, what my amendment was. Oh, well, I'll, be, I'll, I'll help you out here. Thank and you. you Give said me a your clue. statement is, is um, and to do it beautifully, oh, right. which, you know, you know, absolutely, you do beautiful work. Um, so, you that know, tell us. Yes. Well, I just, I feel like the world has so much beauty in it. And anything that we, I mean, and all we are doing is turning it around and spitting it back out in some form or fashion. And if we're going to do that, we, I mean, why not make it beautiful? And that is my, my, that's just everything in the world to me. I mean, and I, and I don't mean it in a superficial way. It doesn't necessarily mean that it has to be art or whatever, but I think that there are so many opportunities to appreciate everything around us. And my way of doing that is just to connect to the beauty and try to translate that to offer people something that will make their lives happy and beautiful and joyful, really. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely, that's wonderful. Um, well, I want to thank you again, Sarah, for um, joining us. Um, it is always a pleasure to work with you and um, we hope to sell more and reorder and reorder and reorder. So those of you who are out there looking and watching with us, please go to our web shop at uh, www.hi.org and click shop and you'll see more of Sarah's beautiful designs. Thank you. And thank you all, to all the artists that are in this to be with you guys is a great privilege. Thanks. Absolutely. Our next artist is a ceramicist um, who's taken his love for nostalgia and robots and turned it into something new. Please welcome Michael Clapter, the creator of Clapter's Universal Robot. Thank you for being with us today, Michael. How are you? Good. Thank you, Patricia. Good to be here. Good. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. You know, your product has been a favorite in our shop uh, for quite some time now, and uh, we are so excited to have you uh, take part in our holiday market for actually the first time. So um, tell me, um, when did you begin creating the robot and how did that come about? Um, I think it was, I, I've been doing them for a long time now. Time slips away a little bit, <laughs> but I think it's been <laughs> about eight years or so. Um, wow. And it kind of came about um, through experimentation. I was working on a series of sculptures that were um, primarily kind of figurative. They'd be animals or, or human figures or something like that, um, used in kind of a narrative way. And you get to a point sometimes where you work in a series of sculptures where maybe you, it's kind of run its course or you've told the story and I was ready to try something new. And um, mm -hmm. at the time I was working in um, a local in Atlanta uh, art center and kind of learning and, and simultaneously teaching uh, how to throw pottery. Because if you're involved in clay in some way, you're gonna wanna get your hands on the, on the wheel. Right, right. <laughs> um, I think I've taken one ceramic class 
in high school and when everything folded in, it, that was it for me. I went to dance. <laughs> yeah. It's <laughs> Started tough. doing dance. <laughs> it is challenging. That's uh, kind of why I went with sculpture first, honestly. I was a little intimidated. But um, yeah, that was in school. But uh, as I, you know, continued my career and stayed with ceramics, um, working at this art center, I said, you know, I got to I got to get into this. And yeah. so I would be throwing the pots and seeing these cups and bowl shapes coming out. But that that interest in sculpting and um, creating figures and stuff kind of still remained. And so using those little vessels, I figured out I could kind of combine them and make these weird shapes. And they started turning into rockets and little ray guns and robots and things wow. like that. Um, so I sort of took the pottery angle and, and brought it into my interest in sculpture as well. Right, right. And you know, I was reading um, uh, your bio and watched your video and the rockets and robots are uh, really like a blast from the past. Uh, you take um, robots and those futuristic sci-fi uh, robots from the 50s and 60s and that's how you come up with your designs um, for your pieces. And uh, I just immediately thought of uh, the the robot in lost in space warning warning Will robinson you know and um it's just such a um it's really you you do get that feeling of nostalgia when looking at your pieces and you kind of connect to them at least the old those of us who are a little older to remember uh, lost in space um you really do connect with it in some sort of way um, that makes you happy and you feel good uh, looking at each piece and and they all seem to have their own personality. So when you are designing them, because I know their faces are also different and you can see um, with our guy here, I'm gonna pull him over. Um, this is right eye and I like right eye because I'm a right eye. <laughs> yeah. and I've been doing that for a long time, but yeah, I can do right eye and um, so you can see that he's, you know, has that um, uh, kind of a constructed feeling, but then he's still, you know, that robot from the past as well. He's, he's new. So tell us a little bit about the expressions that you create um, when, um, you know, designing your robots. How'd you come up with that? <laughs> um, I think it's, it was a fun challenge for me to take something like a robot that's traditionally, you know, known as like a mechanical and an emotional and things like that and try to figure out how I could work in those personalities, um, whether it's through the facial expression or the posture, because I do still want to continue that kind of quality of um, narrative in my work, kind of storytelling. So these mm -hmm. become characters uh, a, a little more than just objects. Um, you know, if, if you kind of say, you know, this one might be kind of tired or this one looks a little cranky, it, it gives them a little bit of depth. And yeah. it's something I like, um, you know, in, in what I create, it's something that I kind of seek out when I look for art. Um, it, it gives me that that good, you know, connection with the uh, with the pieces that I really enjoy. So I want to I want to try to impart that. And I'm, I'm glad you said that that kind of resonates with you. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and <laughs> Ashley actually has the mug. <laughs> nice. Yeah, I I bought this with my own money from my employment <laughs> um, because I thought it was so cute. And I have honestly seen children have fits in the shop over these, which I think is a testament to how much people love them, so. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, yeah so we, we all love them. Well, do we have any questions, Ashley, or comments in the, in the box just yet? Not yet? Okay. No well, questions. Um, I have a question. Do you have any bigger size mugs? Because I love coffee and it's a little <laughs> small. I'm going to be honest. I can't okay. fit as much as I want. <laughs> <laughs> you need a little bit bigger one. Guy. 
Yeah. 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 I need him. Yeah, you might want that guy. Yeah, yeah that's actually bigger. Gonna design. have a collection. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and, and the beauty of your products is that they are. It's a work of art, but it's usable. So it has, um, you know, creative form and function, and um, they are usable. Of course, they're not microwavable, but um, you know, people can use them, or you can have them out on your shelf and display them as art, which is great. Thank you. Yeah, that was um, kind of a, a progress for me too. I think when I first started doing the the work on the wheel that I had mentioned and turning them into sculptures, um, it became a little bit of a way for me to practice working on the wheel, but a little bit of a way that I didn't need to, I could get around um, concentrating on the functionality of the pieces. Um, so I got good practice in, you know, you make, I make one little, you know, robot about this size, that's five or 10 little different components I have to throw on the wheel. Right. But after a while, um, like the pieces that you all are carrying, the mugs and such, um, I did want to start concentrating on the functional aspect of them as well. And it's, a, it's sort of a whole new ball game, um, thinking about, you know, the, how it feels in your hand, the ergonomics mm. of a piece. Uh, for instance, the mugs are designed, that kind of bulb shape was a design that I thought of to kind of insulate the coffee mm. sort of naturally, as opposed to like a, a shape that would be like this, a curved in shape sort of holds your, the heat a little bit better, keeps it warm a little bit longer. Um, things like that are, are, are fun for me to kind of experiment with and now work in a, a functional aspect along with the sculptural details. Right, right. Well, you know, I know you also make larger pieces. Mm -hmm. So what is the largest piece you've created so far? Uh, I think last year I did kind of a, probably about the biggest one. It was, I think about two and a half feet tall. He could kind of stand, it, it was just this upright standing robot. Um, wow. That, uh, yeah, could just stand right beside me. Um, yeah, when you get into that territory, it does, it also becomes kind of an engineering feat. I mean, this is still yeah. all just play. Um, so, you know, the, the, the posture and the pose has to be all right. And right. I put them together sometimes, especially with a piece like that, um, I will fire them in parts. So you have the legs and the torso and the arms all separate. And I don't know how it's going to come together. I hope that my measuring and weighing is <laughs> <gets> out because <laughs> when I glue it together, um, luckily that one was just fine. And yeah, it stood sort of about two and a half feet tall. So that was right. Do moment. you ever make a mold first and then uh, create the piece from a mold? I have thought about it. Um, but I haven't yet. One of the aspects that I, I like about these is um, the originality of each piece. Um, so with a mold, it would be nice to have um, kind of a production line of a certain piece, mm -hmm. but I would lose a little bit of that uniqueness to each one. And so for now, I've decided to, to stick with that latter option. Um, but I think probably it, I, I've experimented with it and um, probably that's something that'll be coming in 2021 is like a kind of a limited uh, production line of certain things, maybe smaller uh, robots or rockets that are, will be kind of collectible um, yeah. cultural items. Yeah, I can see that, you know, people love to collect um, sci-fi pieces mm -hmm. and, um, you know, display them. Well, when we were in, uh, coming into the office, people generally put them at work and, you know, have them displayed across their desktop on a shelf or, or anything like that. So, but what does it, what, how long does it actually take to make one piece? One piece from start to finish might be, I mean, it could be as many as three weeks. Um, 
that includes me throwing the pieces on the wheel to start out. Mm -hmm. And then there's some drying time in between. Um, you kind of cut these pieces and reassemble them into, you know, the finished piece, but it's, it doesn't have any color or glaze on it. Mm -hmm. So that is, um, from that time on, there are three different kiln firings that are involved. Um, and that is to build up that first, that real bright color that you see on a lot of the pieces, and then um, higher temperature firings will build up that metallic and that kind of rust quality to them. Um, but a lot of that is downtime of drying, firing, cooling, waiting. <laughs> so I'm able to start yeah. other pieces in between and you get kind of a cycle going. Of, oh, okay. Yeah, a little production going there. Oh, but, okay. Well, um, you know, what, uh, what questions do we have? Ashley, we have any questions out there just yet? Not yet? Oh, okay. Well, they must like all the information we're giving. Right. So. Yeah, I think we're just doing a really good job at explaining things. Yeah. Um, it I do want to say again, you know, we're doing videos of all of these artisans on our Facebook page. Uh, they're all living on the Highs website as well when you go to the holiday market event. Um, and Michael's video on there is really great. It's a ton of fun to watch. So you can watch them in action there as well. And if you have any questions for any of our artisans, please uh, give, give them a comment on our, our Facebook. I know a lot of people are watching on Facebook now, so. Great, Great. awesome, awesome. Well, Michael, I wanna thank you again um, for taking part in our holiday market. Um, and I encourage our visitors and viewers to um, go to our website at www.hi.org and click on shop and you'll see more of Michael Clapter and uh, also see his beautiful creations and you can get your mug for your coffee. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> well, you and your family have a wonderful holiday and we'll talk to you soon. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. All right. Wow. We are just cruising along, Ashley. And um, this has been great. And uh, thank you to our viewers for logging in and joining us again today. Um, our next uh, artisan and creative are a mother and son team, Linda and Cameron Gibbons, who are the founders of Danny Lynn, which is a leather goods and accessories line. The line is formally called, was formerly called Kalinda, Kalinda's Closet, and they were featured in Where Women Create uh, magazine, as well as Voyage ATL, which is an e-magazine. Welcome, uh, Cameron and Linda. How are you today? We're doing well, thank you. Cameron's on oh. mute. <laughs> yeah, Cameron, you have to unmute there. So I think I think if you hit well. it, yeah, there you are. Right. Hi, Cameron. This is our first time meeting, so it is so wonderful yeah. to meet you. Um, no. You know, I've seen your picture, but um, mm -hmm. I've not had an opportunity to meet you. Linda has been involved with our holiday market in the past, and um, yes. just what I'm just glad to have you here today with us. No, thank you. Glad to be here. Uh, just you know, get a little busy sometimes with work and school, so. Just try to stay on top of everything. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine. And um, uh, running a business and uh, going to school is is a lot, and it you know takes a lot to do to pull off. But you have been doing a fantastic job designing your bags and um, creating a a brand that people know and love. Um, so why don't you tell us a little bit more about the Danny Lynn brand? Well, the, the Dan brand is a uh, pretty, uh, we try to make things in small batches. So we try to have exclusivity and uniqueness. So we uh, like to reach out to shoppers that don't really uh, like the mass appeal and the super mm -hmm. trendy uh, over uh, populated items. Uh, so we try to incorporate different fabrics. Uh, one of our favorite fabric pieces to incorporate is the, the molas that's indigenous mm -hmm. from uh, Bogota, Colombia. 
And mm -hmm. so we tried to do more colorful, vibrant uh, patterns and uh, to uh, go along with our uh, pieces. So we can, uh, you know. Yeah. yeah, I have, a, actually I have one of your pieces right here. Um, yeah. It's been, uh, and I can show our viewers what you mean by that MOLA um, mm -hmm. fabrication. So you take the leather as well as um, the fabric and mm -hmm. uh, create the MOLA. Now, I have a question about this. Is this fabric um, hand embroidered or is it, um, uh, how is it yeah. made? It's, I know it's cotton, <laughs> but how is it made? Yeah, Patricia, the each of the, the patterns are hand sewn. Um, and it's kind of a, it's kind of an overlay through each of the, the colors and the pattern. And the way when you the MOLA tradition, each artisan who creates the pattern, it's kind of unique to either family history or a story that they want to tell. So we try mm -hmm. to even name some of the patterns after something that is more unique um, so that it comes across. But if you ever take a mola apart, it's kind of superimposed on top of another piece of fabric to kind of protect it. But each of the hand stitching is, uh, it's someone sitting down and hand stitching each of the pattern. And so mm -hmm. they're usually quite unique. They come in panels. And so I think we, we provided two handbags of the same pattern because they come in a panel and we create sisters. I guess the mm. sister patterns. Right, um, right, sister bags. We not, yeah, we, we <laughs> try not to have a hundred of any one thing. You might see maybe a pair or you might see four of a certain pattern, but we try to keep it pretty distinct so that when someone buys a bag, you'll never see, you know, 20 other people carrying the same pattern. Right, right, it's not the same pattern. Yeah. yeah. Um, the other thing is that you mentioned that uh, your bags come from Colombia, that uh, at least that part of the bag. And tell me, um, with um, your bags coming uh, from another country, um, how is it that you're helping to give back and uh, allowing artisans to yeah. uh, use their um the skills that they've learned and, and have been in a part of their culture for hundreds of years. So tell yeah. us a little bit about that. Yeah, no, absolutely. So the, the fabric comes from Colombia, uh, but we've made our handbags both there in Bogota and here in the US. And so um, we're even coming out with a new pattern that is um, inspired by Eastern um, China and so back in the Ming Dynasty. And so our fabric patterns are inspired by other world cultures, but we make the bags different places. They don't all come, come from Bogota. Um, but when we originally started through Kalinda's Closet, we had a relationship with someone who was part of the council in Bogota. And it's a pretty big fabric that is even staged in museums. If you go to mm -hmm. the one of the largest museums in Bogota, you will see displays of MOLA. Um, wow. And it's in, in it's it's making sure that they are staying true to the culture. They are paying respect and homage to um, to certainly not just the style but the artwork and the craft behind it. Um, and so mm -hmm. we created this relationship through. Um, this individual that we met, and he sits on the council. And that's how we were able to uh, use that partnership. And part of the proceeds of what we pay to have the design, it goes back to the village and the women who actually create the handiwork and the patterns that we use. Wow, that's awesome. That's awesome to be able to um, have a company and a brand that not only uh, does trade here in the U.S., but also trade in 
other countries and support communities. So that, oh, that's absolutely. very important. That's, yeah. Ashley, do you uh, have any questions? Yeah. Uh, what kind of materials do you use? I know you've seen the leathers, but do you have any other materials that you work with? Um, we have a, a denim handbag that I don't know if Patricia um, has it handy, but mm -hmm. we yeah, try to handy. take fabric and combine it with leather pieces. And so this is a denim. This one's pretty popular. Um, it comes in black and blue leather trim. Um, I always like to show the feet because sometimes when you need to lay your handbag down, um, we're trying to make sure that it stays um, without, we, so that we're not destroying the fabric. We also have suede um, wallets that are pretty interesting. I love to show this one because oh, yeah. it's kind of a 3D. It's not the slim wallet that you typically see. So you can house a whole bunch of things. I can usually put my phone and, and keys in there and they, and they kind of fit without destroying yeah. the structure. Yeah, that one's great. You can carry as a clutch. Mm -hmm. Just a, I've carried going that. Going out for the evening. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've carried it to a number of occasions. Um, I try to be a walking store. And so everywhere I go, I try to carry <laughs> a handbag. And people usually ask me about them. And we, we gain a lot of sales. So I'm shameless about that. Hmm, awesome, awesome. Um, so people are attracted to uh, the mola of your handbags and tell us a little bit about the leathers that you use on your, on, with your bags as well. Yeah, we use only Italian leather um, and, it, and it's, we use Napa leather and it's because it's, it's supple when needed um, and its structure can hold up and, and it's durable. And so we yeah. try to make sure that if people are carrying our handbags every day, that they're able to maintain its structure, that they're, that they're durable, um, and that there's a safety feature to everything that we do. And so the, um, the denim handbag that I showed you, it comes with a, um, a lock here this way that keeps everything secure, but then it creates this beautiful, you know, kind of unique look and kind of turns it into a V versus yeah. just a regular rectangular shaped bag. Um, mm -hmm. We have another beige handbag that I also, I also love. It's um, again, Italian leather. The details of this is just, I don't know if you could see that it's really unique and all the stitching. Um, and also, um, I'm into feet um, and keeping things um, clean and keeping things structured so that when you're carrying your items every day, um, you're still able to keep a bag that, that keeps the shape that is durable. I, I, I don't want people to spend, if, um, our prices are um, you know, somewhere in the middle of the road. And so we want it to be a good value for people. Yeah, I can absolutely say um, just from having the bags here in the shop, um, they are, far, you get far more uh, for what you pay for. Uh, they're mm -hmm. reasonably priced and, um, you know, they are large bags, which, you know, usually at uh, the uh, department store level, you would pay probably $300, but your bags are uh, nicely priced um, mm -hmm. within the hundreds, and um, you get a lot of bang for your buck, pretty much. Yeah, yeah. Now, the value is certainly there. We want, uh, someone said earlier that a lot of their pieces are kind of artwork, and if you look at some of our bags, particularly the ones made with the MOLA, they, mm -hmm. they are art pieces in themselves. Yeah. They're very unique. They stand out. Um, a lot of our customers have come back and made other purchases because they're getting compliments and their handbags are getting noticed. And so they come back to us and say, you know, I want a different handbag, but I want that unique pattern. And so right. they, become, they become popular. Right. And you can't find, you know, back again to the MOLA, you can't find that anywhere. Yeah. This your product was the first time I'd ever seen that um, around and uh, you just can't get it anywhere else. Yeah, no, that's, 
that's what we're liking about that. It's it's not something that you can walk into any even boutique locally that you'll find easily. Um, and we pride ourselves in, in, in doing that, and maintaining that. And so we try to find things that are unique. And hopefully one day as we continue to grow, I've created our own fabric patterns that we'll be making in the future. And so creating even more exclusivity. Right. So um, one other question I do have is that what, uh, what can we look forward to seeing from Danny Lynn going forward? Um, you will continue to see some of the Famola fabric. As I mentioned before, we have some new unique patterns of fabric that we've created that we're making. Um, the biggest stumbling block we've had, as most people have faced this year, has been COVID. Um, mm. The factories we use are small, and so they're not, um, you know, we don't, we don't import from China and some of the other larger places. Right. So we try to stay... Uh, with family, other family businesses. And so a lot of them have struggled. And so we're working through some of those issues. And hopefully in, in 2021, you'll see some different clutches with different fabric. And all of them will be handmade. All of them will be beautiful and colorful. Um, Cameron is into color. Um, I think one of his favorite <laughs> colors is orange. And so every time I, try to, I try to have something dark and blue. He's like, no, mom, let's try this. And so yeah, I love orange too. Yeah. <laughs> um, they're, 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 they're from him. <laughs> OK. <laughs> well, we know where the punchy, bright colors will be coming from. Um, before we go, Ashley, do we have any other questions? There's my mute button. Um, <laughs> I have a question. Uh, what's it like working with your mother in a business? <laughs> um, it's actually really good. Uh, we've been best friends for a long time. Uh, she's always been there for me. So anytime I can be there for her, I'd gladly run. So I mean, it's it's fun. We always got along. So I mean, I I really can't complain. Uh, this is always and I didn't you know, pay him to say that. <laughs> <laughs> no 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 <laughs> um yeah no it's 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 been it's been a really good experience and I mean learning from a very accomplished business business woman is I couldn't ask for more yeah yeah and the, the great thing is that you'll be able to take um pass the legacy along of the business and and carry it forward and as uh, technology changes or, um, you know, new fabrications come about, you can infuse that into what you've already built a foundation on and, and just continue to grow. Yeah, course, yeah. yeah absolutely. Completely. Absolutely. Well, I like to thank you, Linda and Cameron, uh, for joining us and being a part of our holiday market. Again, uh, viewers, you can shop uh, the Danny Lynn line uh, at our website, www.hi.org and or come into the shop and you can see the MOLA for yourself and feel in touch and just have a good time. Well, thank you again and happy holidays to both of you. Thank, thank you. you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Did I do it? No. no. Okay, well, we are just, um, we are down to our last artisan for the day, Ashley. And um, I can tell you this lady is a wonderful, wonderful designer. She creates dynamic pieces and her name is Marilyn. Most people know her as Mikey uh, Long of Embellis Accessories. Welcome Marilyn, it's so wonderful to see you and happy holidays. Are oh, you going to need to unmute? <laughs> well, that always helps. Yeah. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you both. It's so, I'm delighted to be here. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. Well, why don't you um, start by telling us about the Embellish uh, brand and designs? Well, I started the uh, line about 15 years ago. Um, 
just out of my love, first love of jewelry, and also my passion for natural stones. Um, the line is bold, it's vibrant. Uh, I primarily work with natural stones and materials and try and create something that's unique and different. Um, and again, it, it's bold. So, yeah. uh, but I like to create pieces that um, will kind of give a person an extension of themselves. So right. a lot of personality in it. And um, I just love it. I love doing it. I love wearing the pieces. Uh, as the previous artist says, I am a walking uh, example of my work, so. Right. Well, you know, your, your pieces are bold, but just so people will know, you do um, create pieces that are not as bold, but you use beautiful um, stones and beads and uh, uh, different unique uh, pieces you find. Um, I, I take it from your travels. Um, mm -hmm. And we actually have one here, and I don't know um, all of uh, the beading here, but um, this lovely, lovely piece here looks like the elephant is ivory, which is my favorite. And, um, you know, some beautiful stones um, that that's, are very elegant. Yeah, that's design. Yeah, that's one of my favorite. Uh, I also love working with color and the, the druzy and the agate is uh, mm -hmm. kind of draws the piece all together. Um, but that's basically uh, a jasper and an agate piece. Oh, it's absolutely beautiful. It's beautiful. Um, and um, well, tell me a little bit about the process of um, how you start your designs. Do you do sketching or uh, do you just kind of visualize them? Mine is, vis is highly visual and it's, it's just my hands. Uh, I don't sketch. My, um, I'm usually driven, uh, the design comes out of actually the, the artifacts that I'm using or the, the beads and the stones. Uh, I don't have, when I sit down to design a piece, I'm really working from the color, the texture of the stones, and, and then that, 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 that's, that focal bead. Um, Usually, um, for example, this is this is a repurposed belt buckle, mm -hmm. uh, and it's with, it happened to have rainforest jasper in it. So I have rainforest jasper slabs, and so in my studio, everything is hanging on the walls and on tabletops. Uh, a lot of the relics and artifacts on tabletops, and so. <laughs> So it's all visual. It really it sounds is. like you're you're back in your shop excavating things. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I am. I mean, it, it's a lot of fun, uh, but it's also trial and error. I mean, I put some pieces together and think. I look at them the next day and think, well, what was I thinking? That doesn't. Work. <laughs> but um, you know, it, there has to be a balance for me. It, it has to. I mean, the size and the stones and and the textures all have to come together. And when it doesn't work at the end of the day, I just have to pull it apart and start over with something else until we get to something yeah. I'm comfortable with. And I feel like my customers will enjoy wearing. Right, now can you show us a couple of those pieces kind of up close because they look, um, they look absolutely exquisite. Sure, um, I wanna show you this um, is one of, this is a nice statement piece, but it's very lightweight. Is oh, it, wow, this, that's this, nice. This is actually wood beads. Mm. It's, wood, it's a very light Manuka wood. And inside here is a small brass mask. Mm. So, um, and it's just built on, a, built on a piece of leather. So it's a very lightweight statement piece. Uh, but it's one of my favorite favorites because, again, all the pieces come together. The brass, the face is there. Um, there's some brass beat, antique African brass beads that. Mm -hmm. that face. So uh, pieces like this are a little more time consuming because just just getting all the beads laid down and glued down into into place is a. Oh wow. 
So how long would that take to, to, to make that piece from start to finish? From start to finish, probably about five hours. Five, wow. Hours, if I'm sticking with it. The right. other part of my process, Patricia, is sometimes I, I start a pro start it and the process isn't working or it's just not coming together for me. <laughs> I will abandon that piece. Again, I got tables all over my studio. And <laughs> I just slide it in an empty space. And uh, I happen to be a very spiritual person too. So, you know, I just say a gentle prayer over that piece. <laughs> and he, and yeah, hope, hope, it, come, hope and, it comes to life. Yeah. And, <laughs> and, often, and more, more often than not, it does. It, it may not come at that particular time. Well, over time, it, it does. I'll get back to it maybe in a week. It may be in a month. Mm. Um, but if I'm out and about and I work with vendors from around the world, I've done a great deal of travel, but I don't travel so much anymore. So it's nice working with the vendors from, I have friends over in Brazil and I love that. Mm. So they'll, you know, come and they bring those uh, beautiful lapis stones or it could be someone, you know, someone from Ghana that will bring a, beautiful piece of brass, whether it's old uh, Ghanaian brass or, or the newer pieces. Um, I have all of that, you know, everything has to be, I'm a highly visual person. So it really mm -hmm. needs to be in a place where I can actually see it and I can envi right. um, envision it coming together. I'm right. not as organized as so many, or, uh, you know, I listen to other artists. <laughs> I, don't, so I don't think any artist is organized. <laughs> <laughs> I've been learning that from working with them, you know, they just have that creative mindset and, you know, they hire someone else to do all the, the, yeah. the administrative and technical things. They just create, create, create. Yeah. So I, I, yeah. I completely understand. I did want to find out though, do you ever do, um, because I know your pieces are like found pieces, they're all unique and different, but do you ever do a collection that's kind of um, pretty much uh, that it groups together? Yes. Uh, maybe using the same beads, but then use other different parts. As a matter of fact, I've just finished a, um, an acrylic collection. Um, acrylic is something that I've not worked with in the past. Mm -hmm. but, um, it's acrylic and wood, and that is a new collection that's coming out the first of the year. Um, but it's, it's a really unique combination. The wood, um, again, is, I love working with the Manuka woods. They're softer, very lightweight, but have brilliant color and some of the acrylic. So I came out with, I'm, I'm working on finalizing a collection of acrylics and wood that I'm really excited about, so. Oh, awesome. Working with the wood. Well, we'll, we'll look forward to seeing that. Oh, uh, yeah, absolutely. See and seeing how those work out for you. Um, yeah, yeah. Do we have any questions out there, Ashley? The only question I got was actually, if there are collections, which you just answered. <laughs> See, answered. you're doing so good. Yeah. See, um, we are, we do so much on it. <laughs> yeah, wow, I'm um, impressed. I do have some collectors uh, who are just, just, just love the old brass and anything that I incorporate the old brass into, they, they're very interested in that. So uh, in, in terms of a formal collection, yeah, we're coming out with one in uh, the first of the year. Oh, awesome. Um, is there anything else you could tell us about those pieces in the back? Because they look so interesting. Yeah, I, um, I love this, this one. This is uh, what I call a, a, this is all sage, sage green and crystal. Mm. So it makes for a very brilliant, a really brilliant piece. Um, the pieces are very different uh, up close, but this is just a slab that I, a, a slab of jade um, that I came across. Um, right. And these are just, this is just a collection of sage beads and spikes. So it's oh, okay. elegant uh, with the pearls. It has all the pearls, mm -hmm. the crystal and the uh, sage beads, but then it's kind of edgy because you have the spikes that are on this last layer, only on the last layer. So when you're wearing it, it, it really makes a bold, beautiful statement. 
and yeah. not that heavy. I also want to show you the piece that I'm wearing. This again is the old brass, but this is um, vinyl. It's just uh, antique brass beads out of Ghana. Uh, and these are just individual vinyl uh, beads and made into two layers. It makes a nice light statement piece. And this is a turtle, two-headed turtle. Wow. And wow. You know, just, uh, the turtle has quite a bit of meaning depending on you know what, what side of the world you're from, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's wonderful that um, you know people can purchase your pieces and feel as if they've traveled the world. Um, exactly. with them, which is really nice. Exactly. And I usually try and s sell the story and the meaning behind the beads. Uh, if you're wearing an agate or if you're wearing a lapis and what the, the meaning of those wearing those stones and having them touch your personal self. So uh, yeah. I think there's a story behind yeah. the beads. And, and that's one of the things that a lot of my customers buy into. It's just yeah, the pieces and then the story. Yeah, I think Ashley has a question out there. Yeah, uh, somebody on Facebook, Billy, is wondering if you make any men's pieces. I have started making men's pieces, uh, oftentimes bracelets, a lot of bracelets, again, with natural stones. Uh, I've also done some similar pieces like this that are really smaller, a little smaller than this, not quite as bold. But yeah, I would... Um, Love to for him to DM me um, and just let me know what you're looking for. There's also some things on the website. Um, the website is embellishyourself.com. So there are a couple of pieces there as well for me. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. So we don't want to leave uh, our gentlemen out. Uh, we want to exactly. make sure we have something for them uh, this holiday season as well. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Marilyn, I want to thank you again for joining us uh, today and uh, being a part of our holiday artisan, a virtual holiday market. Yes. So, um, thank you all thank so you. much. It's been a wonderful opportunity. Sorry about all the technical difficulties, but <laughs> no worries. We're all those are being an artist. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have a wonderful holiday, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Thank you all so much. Bye bye. Yeah, bye bye. Wow, Ashley, we um, this is just part one. It's getting, it's going to get even better. We've had such a wonderful uh, morning. Thank you for joining us and being with us again. Um, again, I'm going to say this. This was part one, part eight, part deuce comes tomorrow um, where you will meet five more of our 10 artisans who are a part of our holiday, virtual holiday artisan market. And uh, please be sure to go to our website at www.hi.org to see all of our artists uh, and their works that are on the website that you can purchase on our online shop or you can come into the museum. Our museum store is open from 12 p.m. to 5 p.m. Tuesday through Sunday. And also, I just want to remind you that tomorrow is Museum Store Sunday. So we ask that in this time where many museums across the country and around the world um, are, have closed their doors or, or are, are open like we are, um, we need your support. And Museum Store Sunday is a wonderful way to support your museums. It's just like uh, today is Shop Small Saturday. Well, tomorrow uh, is a day that's been set aside for museums and cultural, cultural organizations around the world. And if you shop with us, you will receive um, a tote bag, a Museum Store Sunday tote bag for purchases of $50 or more. So we hope to see you come to the shop or visit us online. And lastly, but certainly not least, 
if you are not a member of the High Museum, we ask that you help to support us so that we can continue to bring you unique and different uh, programming, events, and wonderful exhibitions. Please visit us at high.org to donate and become a member. We hope to see you tomorrow. And if not, thank you for your support and happy holidays. Bye-bye.